The 813 trolley bus. It was snowing in Riga, but there was nothing unusual about that. In fact, it was shaping up to be a normal day of Soviet oppression and crippling hunger in the breadlines. Egvaz Graudens was a pretty normal kid, a typical 14 year old of the early 80s who was obsessed with Black Sabbath and Deep Purple, though unlike his American compatriots, he had to get his cassettes from illegal bootlegs and imports. The authorities had banned most of the music he liked, but people made copies and distributed them in hushed whispers at underground concerts and the backs of classrooms. Music was like a drug. Egvaz was addicted to the stuff, and he could only get hold of it by asking the right people a couple of questions. His parents hated him listening to Western music, but not because of the music itself. They were worried what it would mean if he was caught in possession. His mother, Ilarija, was what passed as a housewife. She got up before dawn each morning and had already left the house by the time that Egvaz got up for school. She kicked the day off queuing up for rations, bringing home the breads and meats that she had a talent for stretching out until the next ration day. She queued in a different place each morning, sometimes standing in line from before dawn until after midday, but she didn't always walk away with something in her hands. But that was just a part of life. Her father, Vigans, was a poet and a night watchman, in that order. He worked seven days a week from sundown to sun up, guarding the factories and calling in the cops on the not infrequent occasions when someone fancied their chances. Vigans didn't always know what the factories produced, but times were tough and people were desperate. Those desperate enough would think nothing of breaking and entering, swiping as many boxes and crates as they could get their hands on and worrying about selling it later on. The nights were long and lonely, so Vigans whiled away the hours by writing poetry in his notebook. He knew dozens of poets, and most of them worked the same kinds of jobs so that they could spend as much time writing as they could. He also knew that most of them wrote work that criticised the Soviet government, although none of them would have dared to admit it. It was an open secret that even the government-approved poets who wrote Soviet propaganda had sheaves of political stuff buried in jam jars in their back gardens. Egvaz knew about his father's poetry, but he rarely thought about it. He would have been much more interested if his father had been writing lyrics for the bands he listened to. That morning he was listening to Black Sabbath on his imported Walkman while getting ready for school. He was running a little late, like always, and so he hardly noticed the rumbling in his stomach as he skipped breakfast again and rushed out of the door. It was just coming up to 8am and school didn't start for another hour, but he faced a lengthy commute each day just to get there. He went to Pulksteinu Torna Skola, which the students just called Tornis for short, and his commute to school meant he had to take first a tram and then a trolley bus. He just considered himself lucky that he didn't have to walk like some of his classmates. It was too cold to read his book while he waited for the tram, but once he boarded the thing, he settled into a rear corner and unpacked a battered paperback of a Zygmunt Skujins novel, which he quickly lost himself in. His fingers shook as he turned the pages, and he alternated which hand he held it with so that he could warm the other up inside his jumper. He was so absorbed in the book that he almost missed his stop, and it was only as he disembarked the tram that he realised he was alone. All of the other passengers had disappeared. It was quiet, and the silence itself was disconcerting. As a city kid, even under the Soviets, Egvaz was used to being surrounded by other people. There was almost always someone somewhere, even if they were just a distant silhouette at the end of a side street. He wasn't used to having the entire city to himself. The silence remained for the couple of streets he had to walk along to get from the tram stop to the trolley bus stop. The trolley bus was like the offspring of a tram and a bus. It had a trolley pole and drew electricity from the cables above it like a tram, but it had a bus's wheels and didn't use rails. Thanks to its onboard rechargeable battery, it wasn't confined to the parts of the city that had cables because it could travel for short distances without them. In short, it was a useful way of getting from one part of town to another. Every morning and every evening, Egvaz had to race across the snow to make it from the bus stop to the trolley bus stop. Along the way, he had to pass through a wide open square, which was bordered by tall buildings and which was normally full of pedestrians and workers. But on that day, it was eerily silent, like something from an episode of The Twilight Zone, which Egvaz had seen at a friend's house on an imported VHS. Egvaz's trolley bus stop was on one of the streets that adjoined the square. The layout of the buildings and the slope that the square had been built on meant that he could see the trolley bus coming and race after it if he had to. And that was exactly what happened that morning. He checked his watch as he ran and saw that it was 8.13am. The trolley bus was running early, perhaps because there was still no one around. And when he arrived at the stop, spewing hot air from his lungs as he heaved for breath, he saw that he was the only one there too. That was unheard of, because the route was a busy one and Egvaz was used to hanging from the straps in the trolley bus. And yet the trolley bus was empty. All of the seats were free and the only person on board was the driver, who was staring at Egvaz with bug-like eyes through a thick pair of spectacles and beckoning for him to board the bus. He had a gaunt, almost skeletal face, and his clothes were spattered with mud and dirt, looking badly in need of a wash. He looked more like a farmer than a bus driver, and Egvaz didn't recognise him as one of the regulars, although he didn't pay too much attention to the faces of the 
the people who shuttled him to and from Tornis. He also smelled like the grave, as though he'd buried his uniform beneath the soil and dug it back up again before his shift. Where is everyone? Egvaz asked, taking a step towards the trolley bus but refraining from climbing aboard. This route's normally one of the busiest in the city. The driver shrugged and then shook his head, but he still didn't say anything. Then he reached out a long, bony arm and beckoned once more for Egvaz to board the trolley bus. I... Egvaz began, casting his eyes up and down the length of the trolley bus. I'm not so sure I should... The driver shrugged again and ignored Egvaz as he asked a few further questions. A minute passed and Egvaz had made no move to climb aboard and the driver had shown no sign of responding to his questions. They were at an impasse. The driver made one last gesture to the seat at the back of the trolley bus, then nodded pointedly at the doors. Egvaz shook his head and stepped back, seeking shelter inside the trolley bus stop. The driver slumped back into his seat and gunned the ignition, steering the trolley bus deeper into the city. Egvaz checked his watch, which read 8.18am. The day that followed was one of the strangest of his life. He waited there at the trolley bus stop for what felt like a lifetime, slowly growing colder and colder as the winter freeze worked its way beneath his clothes and into his skin. He was dressed for the weather, but he hadn't been expecting to spend hour after hour with his skin exposed to the elements, and there was still no one in sight. After the first couple of hours had passed and he'd resigned himself to the fact that the trolley buses weren't running on schedule, he gave in to temptation and went for a wonder. He first returned to the large plaza, which remained empty, and then he struck off along some of the side streets, knocking on doors at random and trying the handles when there wasn't an answer. But all of the doors were locked and all of the shops were closed, even the public toilets were shut. As hard as he tried, and he gave it everything he had, he couldn't find another person and he couldn't find shelter. He was all alone, lost in a part of the city that he knew like the back of his hand. He was reminded again of the Twilight Zone. Egvaz had no choice but to go back to the stop and to wait for whatever came first, death or the trolley bus. It was so cold that he couldn't read his book. Even at the height of the afternoon, the temperature was below freezing. As the day progressed, still with no sign of another living soul, the temperatures dropped and Egvaz retreated further into the corner of the shelter, pulling his arms inside his sweater as though he was impersonating a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle. After what seemed like an ice age, the sun went down. After what seemed like two more of them, the sun came back up. The first person showed up at 8.13am the following morning, assuming that Egvaz's watch was still running on time. The first was soon joined by a second and then a third as pedestrians and motorists alike returned to the silent streets of Riga. Unfortunately for Egvaz, he was too far gone to notice. It was a time before mobile phones, and public payphones were a thing for the Western world and not Eastern Europe beneath the iron fist of the Soviets. It didn't take long for Egvaz to be found, but there was a hefty delay as help was summoned, a phone was located and an ambulance called. He was rushed through the streets to a nearby hospital at around 10am, suffering from a combination of frostbite, pneumonia and hypothermia. In the back of the ambulance, as they worked feverishly to save his leg, the paramedics asked Egvaz what had happened. He explained as best as he could, given that he was half-conscious and played with hallucinations. Mostly, he just repeated, the 813 trolley bus, the 813 trolley bus, the 813 trolley bus. But there isn't an 813 trolley bus, the taller of the two paramedics replied. You must be mistaken, kid. Hold on, the other paramedic said. That's not quite true, there was an 813 trolley bus, remember? Only... I don't like to talk about that. You were called out to the scene, weren't you? The second paramedic said. What was it that the investigation found? The driver was suicidal, the taller man replied. He drove it into the river and killed everyone on board. They retired the 813 after that as a mark of respect. Yeah, and because they couldn't find anyone to drive it. The 813 trolley bus, Egvaz said. The 813 trolley bus. How's his pulse? It's fading. The medic replied. We've got a fight on our hands to save this kid. The 813 trolley bus, Egvaz said. Better radio ahead. Kus is dead. I wish the roads were as empty as he said they were when he saw the 813.